chapter six, conservation of energy. So just a reminder, remind you this in every video. This is a summary video for John Batista chapter uh, edition five, college physics. It's just a summary. You probably need to read the book too. Okay, I'm not going to do all the examples in this. It's just the big ideas in chapter six. It's that end part of the chapter that says master the concepts or whatever that. I'm going over all those things. Also, this chapter on energy is kind of a big deal. And I, I wouldn't really present things in the same way this book does. So I'm going to try to do both. I'm going to try to give my take on it and represent what's in the book too, in case you need what's in the book. Maybe you have to, you're required to follow in the book. Let's just let's just think about the main thing that we've done so far, right? Let's think back. I mean, it's not that much. We have this F net equals M A. And then we had the kinematic equations and all that stuff. And I want to write here A is delta V delta T. All right. So this says if you apply a force to an object the net force it changes it changes the velocity because it gives it an acceleration and acceleration is a change in velocity with respect to time it's kind of important okay and we're going to look at this actually same thing in a later way i'd rather prefer this to talk about this in terms of momentum but the book doesn't talk about that yet so i'm not going to either well it turns out there's another way to model the motion and predict the motion of objects. And that's using the work energy principle. So this is, I will write this as Newton's second law. We also have the work energy principle. So we actually have two things that we need to talk about in terms of work energy. Um, the first is work and the second is energy. So we're going to define work. Suppose I have an object and it moves from here to there. So there's a displacement delta r. It's a vector displacement. And then I push on this with some force f and I'm going to push it at some angle like that. Then we can calculate the work done by this force as work as f dot delta r. So here you see something that maybe you haven't seen and it is important. The book doesn't really do this, but I'm going to do this. If you have two vectors, you can't multiply two vectors together. So this is an, another vector operation called the dot product. So let's just talk about the dot product really quickly. Suppose I have vector a. I'm going to do this in two dimensions, but it works in three dimensions. And I'm going to use the notation of the book. Some vector a x, x hat plus a y y hat and then the vector b is bx x hat plus b y y hat i can define the operation of these two vectors called the dot product uh, and i'll say this is equal to c is equal to a dot b and you'll notice right away because i'm really careful about my vector notation that's not a vector so this is an operation between these two vectors that gives a scalar value and this is important because work is a scalar value. It has no direction. It's just one thing. It's just work. I can calculate the value of C. It's pretty easy. It's just the X component of A times the X co component of B. AX BX plus the X Y component of A times the Y component of B. AY BY. That's it. So you just multiply the X's together, you multiply the Y's together, and then you add them. Now there is another way to do this. I can also say this is equal to the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the cosine of the angle between them. So this would be angle theta. And that's the way the book uses it, and they just write A, B, cosine theta. So up here I could say work is F delta R cosine theta. That's the same thing. So that's not a vector. That's not a vector, but you do need the angle between them. So these two give you the same thing. Okay, let's talk, we haven't, I haven't told you about what work does, um, but let's talk about this. If we have work F delta R cosine theta, I'll use that notation. Uh, this force is in newtons. Delta R is in meters. Cosine theta doesn't have a unit. So if I get something and I do newtons times a meters, that has a unit that we call a joule. And that's a unit of work and that's a unit of energy. 
really got to think about this, right? The work energy principle is a different way of thinking about uh, motions. Instead of focusing on changes in velocity and time, we're going to focus on displacements and not a vector. This is a vector, vector, vector. Work is not a vector. Okay, now what about the energy? So there's a couple energies. They call this mechanical energy um, because I want to write out the work energy principle. Work is the change in energy. That That's the big deal right there. Now, we do need to talk about systems and stuff, but let me go ahead and introduce the idea of kinetic energy. K, one half M, I'm gonna write it the best way, V, quantity squared. It is a scalar quantity that depends on the mass and the velocity of the object. But you have to, you can't square a vector, so you gotta take the magnitude of it first. So you, that usually doesn't come up, but I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to be, I'm just trying to be real with you, okay? Tell you the real things. Okay, now let's talk about systems because the book doesn't really mention this and it is important. So we have the work energy principle, work as the change in energy, where work is F dot delta R, I'm gonna write it my way. And the that's the change in energy. So if I just have one thing, it could be K2 minus K1. It could be some particle. Let's just think about this system of a ball here. I push on it this way with some force F and it moves over here a displacement delta r, and this has velocity one, this has velocity two. So I know the velocity is at the beginning and the end of that. Then I could say f dot delta r, the angle between them is zero, so that's pretty easy, is one half m v two squared minus one half m v one squared. So it's a change in energy, okay? So the work done is the change in kinetic energy. The changes are important, don't forget that. Work is not equal to energy, the change in energy. Now, it turns out that we need to determine what forces do work and what kind of changes in energy we have. Um, the book talks about this non-conservative work. So let me talk about conservative work. Conservative work, I'm going to give you an example. Conservative work. Let's think about an example of uh, the work done by gravity. So suppose I have here the ground, and I have a ball, and I drop it, and it goes down here. So this is y2, this is y1. And I can calculate the work done, and it's gonna speed up so I could find the change in kinetic energy. I know there's a gravitational force, mg, pulling down. Uh, I can get delta r is gonna be equal to the final position. So it's gonna be, doesn't move in the x direction, so zero x hat. Uh, the final position is y2, so plus y2 minus y1, y hat. That's parentheses. So I have that. And in this case, it's moving in the same direction as the displacement. It's a, it's a positive done work done by gravity because it's moving down. Well, it turns out that what if I wanted to do another way to get from here to there, and I went this way, and then this way, and then this way. So now I actually have to do the work along this path, the work along this path, and the work along this path. So along this path, delta R is that way, and the gravitational force is that way. The angle between them is 90 degrees, and the cosine of 90 is zero. So there's no work done along that path. From here to there, it's exactly the same as this. So this work done from here to there is the same as from here to there, and then the work done here is zero. So if I go this way, the work done by gravity is the same as going by this way. And so if you have a conservative force, then the work done does not depend on path. Work. I was, going to, it was, I was going to say not equal to path, but that's not true. It's not equal to the path. It would never be, but you know what I'm saying. Okay, now we can talk about why that matters. Because suppose I take the system, I declare the system of the ball plus the earth. 
then I have this gravitational field as part of my system. And it turns out that gravity doesn't do work on the system because the ball, the earth pulls on the ball, but the ball pulls on the earth the same amount. Remember, forces come in pairs. So there's no work done by gravity because since it's part of the system. It'd be like trying to lift up yourself by pulling on your shoes. It doesn't work. And that's not quite the same thing, but it's kind of like that. So in this case, the work done by gravity uh, doesn't exist. I'll put does not exist, D-N-E. It doesn't, it, it doesn't exist. But what does work on the system then? Nothing. So work is zero equals the change in energy. But if I only have a change in kinetic energy equal to zero, it obviously speeds up. So what I'm going to do is, in fact, take the work done by gravity in the non in the system of just a ball and move it to the other side. So I can say, uh, we're gonna call this a change in potential energy is equal to negative the work done by a conservative force. And in this case, that would be a change in potential energy of mgy, delta y. And in fact, we could just say, the gravitational potential is mgy. So if I include the ball and the earth in my system, I will not have work done by gravity, but I will have a change in potential energy. So I have zero is change in kinetic plus change in gravitational potential energy. But it depends on what I pick for my system. That's very important. If I pick just the system of the ball, then I do have work done by gravity. So you have to pick. Do you want to do work done by gravity or do you want to have no work done by gravity and have gravitational potential energy? And this is just a review, just a reminder. We're going to do some problems, some practice problems on this too. Okay. It turns out that there are some other ways. So let me just say work, change in energy, system, important. Um, then we have kinetic energy, one half mv squared. We have gravitational potential energy, mgy. Uh, I'm going to show you two more potential energies. Uh, and then we have work as f dot delta r, which is f delta r cosine theta. What about this? This comes from, this is mgy. Uh, that's the potential, we really care about the change. This comes from Fg equals mg, the gravitational force. It's the work done by that gravitational force. But what if I have this? Here's a planet, and then here's an object up here really far away. The, the force on that we'll call it Fg. The magnitude of it is g mass 1, m1, m2, m1, m2 over r squared where that's r. That's the real gravitational force. This is just an approximation of that. So what if I use this and do the work done by this? Well, it turns out that the, the work done by this is not easy because if I move towards the Earth, r changes. So you have to, you have to do something more complicated. Uh, we can do this numerically or with calculus, but other than that, you can't. But it does have a, it is conservative. So I can get a gravitational potential energy that looks like this, negative g m1 m2 over r and this is the potential with respect to infinity so at infinity distance away we would say there's zero potential and it's negative because it's an attractive force notice that this is technically a vector we don't draw it like that because it gets complicated but it is a vector it's a force it's a vector this is not this is scalar Okay, we have another force. There's another very important force and energy, and that's called the, uh, uh, the force due to a spring. So it turns out that if you have a spring like this, and I pull it so it moves over here, a distance delta s, 
Well, let's just call that S. I think the, the book calls it S. Then there's the spring's going to pull back with the force this way. And we can write the magnitude of this force, F, equals KS, where that's the spring force. And this is what we call the spring constant. It's how, oh, I messed up there. It's how stiff the spring is. Now, the book actually writes this as Fx equals negative Kx. That's fine too. The negative just means that it pull, if you stretch a spring, it pulls back. If you compress a spring, it pushes forward. I don't like putting the negative sign in there because it's not a vector equation. You can write this as a vector equation, but uh, you need to put the direction in there yourself. S is the stretch, K is the spring constant, and that tells you the force. But here's another situation of a force that actually is conservative. Uh, so if you include the spring in your system, you can get a spring potential energy of 1 half K S squared. So that's the spring constant, and that's the amount that the spring is either compressed or stretched. Okay, there's one more thing in this chapter, I think. I'm looking over here. Oh, there's two more things. Okay. Uh, this one, it, it's actually kind of interesting. Uh, imagine that I, I stretch a spring, F spring, the force due to a spring, and I plot the uh, force as a function of, of position X. Well, when it's not stretched, or this X or S, it doesn't really matter. As I stretch it, the force gets greater. Well, what if I go from here to there? I go from that force, that force, that position to that position, then I can actually calculate the area under this curve. The area under the curve is equal to the work done. So that also be the also equal to negative the change in potential energy. Is that negative? The work no, it's just the work done. But don't worry about the negative. Okay, one more thing. So work, change in energy, joules, joules. They're both in joules. But we have another quantity that's super fun called power. Power is defined as the change in energy with respect to time. It's how fast you change energy or how fast you do work. And if this is in joules per second, this is equal to a watt. So we can do a lot of great things. And just imagine this. Suppose I have uh, a book on the floor and I lift it up here. So there's a change in, in energy of, let's say, delta E of 10 joules. Well, if I take one second to move that book up here, that's 10 watts. But if I take, you know, one one hundredth of a second, I get like, 10,000 watts. So you get a big difference in, in power, even though it has the same change in energy. Uh, and so that's, whenever we talk about power, it's how fast things happen. Uh, they give an example of, I don't really want to even talk about that, if it's moving at a constant velocity. We'll do that one later. But this power comes up a lot. It comes up a lot in the second semester. I mean, we deal with power in our real lives all the time anyway. Right, you have a a thousand watt coffee maker that's that uses a thousand joules every second, and it's actually easier to talk about the power rather than the energy because it depends on how long you you run it. Um, you know, your house maybe uses three to five thousand watts on average, uh, probably not average because if you do the nighttime, it depends on the air conditioner because those things can use a lot of energy, um, and hair dryers and coffee pots and vacuum cleaners, but there you go. Okay, chapter six summary. Hope you found that useful.